Thank you, Mark. I always feel rather nervous when people clap before I've actually said anything. It makes you realise just how bad it would be if they didn't clap once you had said something. It was also a delight to hear Peter Vermeulen again. I have very happy memories of uh, when he invited me over to Flanders to speak to one of his vast conferences with about 2,500 people present and delighted also to see so many people here today with standing room only and I hope those who are standing aren't too uncomfortable. I was interested in what Peter was saying about the Scottish weather. If you're a visitor to Scotland, the general rule that we use here about the weather is that if you can see the mountains, you know that it's about to rain. And if you can't see the mountains, you know that it is raining. So <laughs> I'd like to begin by saying that this is the first time I've got to the platform of an international keynote in recent years without some uh, catastrophe befalling me on the way, at least not yet uh, anyway. I remember when I was giving my uh, Royal Institution uh, address that uh, I thought I would run down the stairs just a few minutes before I was on the stage um, just to freshen up. And I walked into what I thought was an enormous uh, toilet and uh, went at full speed uh, into one half of it, not re realising that that half was a full mirror wall. So I crashed violently into it, apologised profusely to my own image, and um, <laughs> then get back up to the platform and it was slightly delayed because it was all going to be videoed and uh, someone had to wipe a little blood away from my face on that occasion. I was also asked if I wanted to come in and have a glass of water here and uh, turn the option down, remembering the uh, keynote where I spilt my glass of water over the keyboard and the result was a kind of early celebration of fireworks day. I think the most embarrassing, or perhaps the second most uh, embarrassing, was um, a year past October when I was doing a keynote at the first international conference on nurture in education. And as ever, I just wanted to check beforehand that my slides were in order and so on before it started. So I went out into the foyer of the hotel and I found it was thronged with hundreds of people. I couldn't get peace anywhere. So eventually I found a quiet spot on the fourth floor uh, in the toilet. And it was a completely deserted toilet. So I thought, this is great. I went into a cubicle, locked it, sat down and opened my laptop. And once, once I had prepared my slides, I uh, leaned forward, opened the door, and I was about to go out and I thought, oh no, there's something else to check. So I sat down again and I didn't realize that it was a self-flushing toilet. <laughs> and the signal for the flushing was opening the check on the door. And uh, so it flushed, I was fully clothed, and I was absolutely soaked. And I stood up with the water dripping from my rear just a few minutes before being in the platform. And I thought, they'll, they'll probably think that my nerves had just got the, the better of me on this occasion. So I thought, what can I do about it? And then I saw the hand dryer. Now, and, Unfortunately, hand dryers are set at the height for your hands. <laughs> However, being fairly athletic, I um, managed to get myself into a position where some good was being done, and then somebody came in. And um, it's all a bit of a blank after that. I'm just hoping, hoping that I didn't give my stock reply of, uh, it's all right, I'm a psychologist. <laughs> but um, I, would, I would like to... <laughs> I would like publicly to thank Edinburgh International Conference Centre for not having uh, self-flushing toilets. <laughs> My uh, subject today is uh, autism practice today, where are the gaps? Now perhaps the first question you'll be asking as I go through this is why I'm not speaking about your particular gap, whether you're a parent or a professional or a person on the autism spectrum, because you see there are gaps across the board in practice, more than I could select today. 
And it may be that there are particular gaps that you are aware of that may indeed dominate your whole life or the life of your family. But I'm going to speak on some of the gaps today. We have learnt a great uh, deal in my own research team over the last period about the needs of people on the spectrum and about the gaps in services because we have been occupied in a very large, very important Scottish Government study, the Autism Micro Segmentation Study, with myself and colleagues uh, who are with us today from the University of Strathclyde and Professor Martin Knapp and colleagues from London School of Economics. And uh, I know that Martin Knapp has, uh, and his colleagues have a number of uh, papers and presentations here and no doubt will be referring to the project. And in terms of ascertaining the needs of people uh, on the spectrum, we carried out what we called the Scottish Autism Survey. And the challenge was we felt we needed to get at least 200 people um, to fill in one of these questionnaires, which most people might start and then very, very quickly give up because it was very detailed, over 30 pages. With a fantastic response, over 1,600 uh, responding, complete data for somewhere around about 1,000, with now possibly about the richest data set in the world, covering so many things to do with diagnosis, comorbidity, educational placement, all sorts of uh, provision, intellectual status, employment, and going right across the lifespan. I've put in some of the statistics that have been put before me at various times, one and a half million cells of data, about 8,000 pages of descriptive statistics, happily not uh, printed out on paper. If you're interested in that study, there's an overview of the study and its aims in the uh, special supplement of Good Autism Practice, uh, published in 2014. I want to speak about five uh, gaps in autism practice today. Diagnostic practice and provision, mental health and therapy, leisure and recreation, independence and public transport, and criminal justice. And in some ways, I'm choosing these areas partly because they represent, in my view, very significant gaps, and also because they reflect the areas in which I have uh, at various times been working and publishing over a very long period of time. But let me begin by referring to some of the things that we actually don't know. First of all, we don't know how many people are on the autism spectrum. For quite a long time, we have thought we knew and we have thought different things at different times. For example, a few years ago, we thought it was about uh, 60 per 10,000 or six in every thousand. And then a little later, we revised that to the most commonly accepted figure for a period, which was about 1%, about one in a hundred. Um, and we've had various other estimates going uh, up since then, but also estimates that are so wide that it will indicate the breadth of the difficulty. There, for example, are two studies published recently, the same year, one of them with um, a prevalence of 1.4 per 10,000 and one with a prevalence of 264 per 10,000. A number of years ago, uh, I published something which was predicting what the future of prevalence and various other things in autism would be. And one of the things I said was that there was a historical inevitability that prevalence figures were going to rise very significantly anyway and well beyond the framework in which we were talking at that time, but also that much of that rise would not actually be because there was uh, that genuine prevalence, but because of other factors which were not actually of a clinical nature. We have seen some of uh, that uh, and now we're finding that higher figures are being quoted. And just last year, Dylan Berger and colleagues published a paper indicating 3.5%, 350 in 10,000. And almost every data point has been represented in one or other study. Asperger's ranging from 0.3 in 10,000 to 48.4%. 
per 10,000. And it does mean that by chance expectation, since we've looked at all of these studies, and some of them the methodology is very, very flawed, and others it's very good, but by chance expectation, some of the worst studies are going to be providing uh, some of the truest rates. But also, we don't know how many people with autism have an intellectual disability. Estimates have ranged up to around 83%. The most common estimate that has been used, particularly for uh, budget planning and, uh, and uh, provision planning, has been about 55% with an intellectual disability. Now, prevalence and intellectual disability are of the most fundamental importance. And the reason for that is that when we're looking at how to fill the gaps in the autism spectrum and in practice. And when we're looking at how to plan services, we need to have some idea of how many people we're planning for. And it's very important to know in group terms and population terms, what proportion of these people have an additional intellectual disability because the economics of intellectual disability and autism indicate that very much more demand is going to be made on economic cost and service provision if there is that additional disability. Now, for various reasons, a lot of the figures we have looked at, we have felt don't make clinical sense. And we therefore felt that one of the very important things for us to do in laying some of the foundations was to have a fresh look at prevalence and a fresh look at intellectual disability. Now, we have done that with two very, very wide-ranging meta-analyses involving thousands and thousands of uh, studies. And uh, my colleagues are here today and over the course of this conference will have um, a couple of posters and an oral uh, presentation covering these uh, subjects led by Michael Connolly. And what we are proposing, just to give the headline figure, is a prevalence, a very recognisable one, of about uh, 104 per 10,000, 1.04% uh, as a reliable basis for planning and service provision. And for intellectual disability, we're proposing that a reliable estimate is in the low 30s, about 32.7% of those in the spectrum who have an intellectual disability. Now, that's a very different figure from what we have been used to. I believe it's a figure which does make clinical sense. I had uh, predicted at the start of our study before we went through the actual research that if it wasn't looking like something in the 30s, it was probably going to be wrong. Obvious reasons for that, the spectrum has become broader. Diagnosis has extended to less uh, severe uh, difficulties. And uh, even if you take um, Gilberg's study of the prevalence of Asperger's uh, syndrome a good number of years ago, it was coming out about 36 per 10,000, which was higher than the prevalence for uh, core autism itself. And uh, Chris Gilberg agreed that you could actually have doubled that figure if they had used very slightly less strict uh, criteria. So I think it's going to be very important in terms of planning to be considering the implications of these figures. I'm going to speak um, just a few thoughts on each of these areas. First of all, diagnostic practice and provision. We know that early diagnosis is crucial for all sorts of reasons. For the last uh, 10 years or so since it began, I've been clinical director of the National Diagnosis and Assessment Service here and um, just looked at the median age of the last 100 individuals were diagnosed right up to a few uh, days ago. And um, we cover children and adults, but much more commonly adults because child services are more widespread. And the median age was 31. Now that points to various things. It points to the fact that as children, they have certainly not been picked up, but even as adults and young adults, they've still not been getting picked up with diagnostic services sometimes until very far into adult life. There was a Scottish uh, ASD audit. Um, it was carried out in 2004. And um, we have figures from that 
If you look at what we would expect the adult population of Scotland to be on a figure of um, around one in a hundred, it should be about 43,500. The Scottish audit um, found that the total number of recorded adults from health boards in Scotland was uh, 645. Now, I know that because a person is on the spectrum, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to be or to have to be uh, registered with some kind of public service, but most people do, in fact, need service provision. There are records of most of those who have been diagnosed, and there is enormous levels of underdiagnosis. But also of children, and the children position has improved dramatically over the past few years, and the Scottish Government has taken many initiatives in this respect. But again, with the audit in 2004, there were only 3,400 children and young people diagnosed. That worked out a prevalence rate far, far lower than what we would expect, indicating very significant underdiagnosis. And although that's improved, uh, it still does reflect uh, the, the broad situation. So there are gaps in autism and diagnostic practice. There are many places where the waiting list is two years or more, and that's not acceptable. We have published on what have been effective and successful strategies of moving diagnosis down from these regional specialist teams down to local level teams to which we provided uh, training and support, did research which indicated that there was good concordance where we were doing dual diagnosis between the regional and the local teams. But generally speaking, we're not having teams at a local enough level. Adult diagnosis, vastly under-resourced. Gaps in skills and training when we published the national uh, uh, framework for autism uh, a good number of years ago. We were talking about the vast lack of skills and training. And what is being indicated from a fresh look at that is that that is a pattern which, while improving, is still one that has very major gaps in, in it. Also, if you have autism and a learning disability, you can find that you're ping-ponged between starting off with mental health services, being sent to disability, learning disability services, and sometimes coming back again. And if you're a young person, then you can also be caught in the gap between child and adult services. I want to move on quickly to mental health and therapy. Is mental health a special issue for the autism spectrum? <clears throat> These are figures from uh, Green et al, the mental health of children and young people in Great Britain. It was uh, published in 2005. There's another one in process, but it's um, just finished the consultation phase, so the uh, new figures aren't available yet. Now, I have to say, if you're familiar with the Green et al uh, survey, the, the figures and the, the, some of the methods, I think, are dreadful. The figures are all over the place. There's no clear, in my view, classification of what different terms mean. And um, there are overlapping uh, conditions and everything else that aren't clearly defined. But even with all that um, kind of mush that comes into to that survey, the message is absolutely clear by any standard there is a special issue for the autism spectrum in mental health, because whatever domain you look at, far more people in the spectrum have mental health issues. Very high levels of the things that we're very familiar with, anxiety, um, not just at subclinical level, but actual clinical anxiety disorder, measured as high as 55%, high levels of depression, of uh, two-thirds, uh, up to two-thirds with Asperger's syndrome in particular, where mental health issues are greater than in core uh, autism, and um, all mental health disorders for adults with very much higher prevalence. We have highlighted the lack of trained staff with expertise in therapy for ASD, which does involve doing some different things, and also the lack of specific uh, resources Therapy at times can do harm. This boy was referred to me, 15-year-old boy with autism, PTSD, a very minor uh, accident in a bus in which he was travelling, but he does have autism and he also has a learning disability, became unable to travel in buses, then any vehicle, 
offered therapy by a standard uh, CBT therapist using the standard protocol, that traumatised him further. And at the time I was called in to see him, it was housebound. He couldn't get out of the house at all because he um, had, instead of gaining from therapy, had found that it had precisely the opposite effect. We need those with training in how to adapt a therapeutic protocol for uh, the autism spectrum. The NICE guidelines have, uh, in the UK, and they are international guidelines, have highlighted these issues, limited availability and lack of adaptation of programmes. A number of you will be familiar, no doubt, with uh, one of the ways we have sought to address this in our own work with our homunculi programme <coughs> and um, understand that a, a few copies will be available if you want to see them at the Jessica Kingsley stand. We published it in 2013. And what we were aiming to do was to, for children and young people, was to have a, an evidence-based resource, but one which was autism specific and one which took account of the autism theories, theory of mind, weak central coherence, uh, executive function, effective theories of autism. We uh, started off by looking, and we've published on it quite a number of times between uh, about 2005 and uh, last year so far, and uh, looking at anxiety, depression, anger, stress, we've become very, very familiar with this pre-post picture of how, um, work, whether working with groups or individuals, all these things are coming down below clinical levels. That was a study we published with um, about, say, 20 of a sample, and again showing this clear pattern of the reduction in um, these uh, difficulties and with good effect sizes indicating uh, how the results were really meaningful results. Uh, did it work? When we first ran an Asperger group, my colleague, uh, Dr. Anne Gregg, had a, a brief um, a feedback session. This is a one minute video. At least it might be a, a, a no minutes video. Uh, there we go. No, I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant project as it is. I can't think of anything to improve. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I'm going to have to agree with most of the others and sort of pass on this one because I don't really see any way the monthly project could be made better. Any of the stuff that you were doing ever feel you make you feel bad about yourself and Asperger's? Through the monthly, um, I've learned that Asperger's. Isn't so much a disability. You don't find that I ask you um, to be a bad character. Okay. Uh, from this whole project, I've realised that Asperger's syndrome can be beneficial. Okay, just a one minute uh, snippet on what some of these young people were saying. I know we had to slip them a few bank notes just to get it that good, but uh, you know, we've, we were very, very happy with the outcomes. And we followed some of these boys up over the, the years and have seen some encouraging and sustained developments. We've developed a programme further because as what you do need targeted interventions for those who already have mental health problems in autism, but you also need inclusive approaches and anxiety is quite prevalent and by tackling it at universal level, here we took two schools and used complete mainstream classes which included those with autism and other additional support needs and we've had, not published that yet, but we've had very encouraging results with that also. Quickly, something about leisure and recreation. The things that I've put there, the first two things, don't just apply to autism, they apply to the research on leisure and recreation for the general, the whole population. It's central to quality of life and it's central to general development. The Dead Poets Society, I don't know if you ever watched that film, but I saw it a number of years ago and I remember being impressed when the teacher was telling these boys in his class why poetry was more important than science. And it seemed very uh, paradoxical 
but it was pointing out that science essentially is mainly doing the things that you have to do, the things that are necessary. When you move above that level, you get into the luxuries and the things that we're really wanting life to be about, and that's where poetry fits in. You may be familiar with Marlowe's famous uh, hierarchy of needs, and um, down at the bottom, you've got the things that we absolutely need to look after, our physiological needs, our safety. But as it moves up that hierarchy, you come to love, to esteem, to self-actualization. And leisure and recreation, they're not the things that are necessary for our survival and safety, but they're very important as you come up the hierarchy of what makes quality of life. There is a need for leisure and recreation in ASD um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, the limited access to normal social opportunities, the whole business about the need to make and sustain friendships and many other things, the difficulties at times of being able to or having opportunity to mix with others in ordinary settings. We did a, a study in this uh, a number of years ago, myself, uh, Helen Marwick and uh, Charlene Tate at our National Centre for Autism Studies, and our sample was every single child and young person in a very large uh, council area in Scotland, interviewing parents, professionals and young people. And it was very clear overall that there were mammoth gaps. And this was quite a good authority that was actually doing quite a, quite a lot. But mammoth gaps, parents wanted barriers removed, they wanted access to the provision, they wanted better awareness of staff and also of public, uh, better supervision, more information. And young people on the spectrum, those that were able to participate and communicate, simply wanted to have normal social contact and normal circumstances, to have friends, to be understood, to be independent, to be included. The research on autism, there, there aren't very many studies, but the research indicates that limited access leads to all these things that also feed into to, to mental health issues uh, as well. And um, having good leisure activities uh, along with others, it helps all these things like social and language skills and the creation of adult identity. Major gaps in this area at the present time the uh, inaccessibility of mainstream services, lack of awareness, lack of supervision, lack of information. And we don't just need the mainstream services to be accessible. Some won't be able to access these no matter how accessible they're made, perhaps. And we need autism-specific leisure and recreation services as well. I remember at the time we were doing that study, we um, searched our databases and we found thousands of studies, uh, of course, on autism. At that time, we found only one that was specifically in leisure and recreation. Out of interest, I just did it again um, yesterday with uh, then CBI database, uh, 5296 references for autism, but only five which had any central relevance to the question of autism and leisure and recreation. Moving on quickly to independence and public transport. How central this is for people on the autism spectrum. It's clearly crucial that if you want to be independent, if you want to be socially included, if you want to be able to go to a job, you're almost certainly going to have to have access at times to transport to get you to do these things. If you have an autism spectrum disorder, you're more likely not to have a car or a driving license than <clears throat> uh, others of the same age in the general population. But you may also find that you're unable to use public transport. Research has indicated all sorts of fears, getting lost, being attacked, not being able to cope. Some of our uh, people in the spectrum are wonderful with maps and schedules and timetables, but others can't um, have the executive function needed to cope with these things and need to rely on visual and auditory cues, which often aren't there. Great needs, but few studies. I uh, first published in this in 1991, at which point I called it a greenfield site. I'm not sure if it's much different from being a greenfield site uh, now. At that time, I interviewed the CEOs of 
every passenger transport executive in the United Kingdom, they all felt that the kind of professional input to help in these areas would be uh, relevant or very relevant to the work that they were doing, and they all felt that the actual input that they had was little or none. A major gap there. Little has changed over a whole generation since I first published that, and the main advances, which have been very significant, have been for physical and sensory disability rather than autism. We have low floor entry, we have wheelchair arrangements, we have tannoy systems giving announcements of when the stop's coming and what it is and so forth, but we don't even, I think, know what the, the relevant questions are to ask about transport and autism some of the time, far less have the answers. Uh, Sally Lindsay has a paper in press at the moment, I'm not sure if it's published yet, a systematic uh, review in uh, disability and rehabilitation, and she refers to an urgent need to fill the gaps in the research and an urgent need for supports for people with ASD. I come to the last thing I've been going through this um, at quite a speed, and this is the last part, and I know we started uh, a few minutes late. Um, key issues here, and again I'm speaking from a field that I do a very large amount of day-to-day uh, -day work in. The things that I have identified as being the key issues are there. The need to have an appropriate adult, as the term is uh, legally in Scotland, someone who can support the person with autism all the way through any process involving the, the police and interviewing and courts and so on. The question of understanding the caution, which is a very complex matter which many can't understand. The difficulty of giving evidence in court. The danger, and it's a very widespread danger in autism, of making false confessions. Many diagnostic issues turning up of people who are in prison and who lack uh, diagnosis or who are coming before the courts and being treated as uh, being part of the general population and it not being realised that they uh, have not received a, an autism diagnosis. Issues regarding behaviour in the community, issues regarding co what's called mens rea. In order to commit a criminal act, you need two things. You need the actus reus, the actual criminal act itself, but you also need it to be accompanied by the mens rea, the uh, frame of mind which involves an actual and genuine criminal intent. And I'm asked very often to come in in relation to that with autism. There are issues with treatment programmes which are usually based on the things that the general population have, like insight and uh, empathy and uh, all the things that come naturally and mixing with a sh social group to uh, share your experiences. And for some uh, people in prison on the spectrum going through these treatment programmes, that's a terrifying prospect. And there's also the question of life in prison. For some, it leads to the verge of suicide for others, on the contrary, as soon as they get out, they commit another crime because they find prison to be the, the safest place for them. Very many issues, and I'm just going to take, uh, as a close, I'm just going to take three of these uh, areas and mention them bri briefly and give an example. Understanding the caution. The caution in Scotland until recently, I think, had over 80 words in it. It's been uh, made simpler because of the efforts of uh, forensic psychologists, um, but it's still very difficult, often for the general population and particularly for the autism population. Often there's this verbal fluency, but the comprehension that doesn't go with it. The working memory deficits of trying to remember what's been said to you that you've got to answer questions about. Speed of processing what the policeman reads out to you your wish to conform to what authority is asking you to do, your desire to please, to appear well-informed, and also to get out of your situation as fast as possible. Here's an example, and they're all examples from cases that have been uh, called to uh, court and other circumstances like that to work with. I was asked to analyse the police transcript for this case of a, a man with autism. 
and the detective constable in, gives the caution and then he says to the suspect, what is your understanding of that? The man with autism replies that if I uh, say something, if I say it can be used either uh, for or against me, whatever I say will be, if it's deemed that it has, would have some indication on, so completely floundering with no idea what the caution was about. Detective Constable says, I'm trying to help him out, evidential value, suspect, that's what I meant. Excellent. So at the end of that, he's had the caution, he's understood the caution, he's agreed he's understood it, and he hasn't the first beginnings of an idea what it was that had happened. And that was um, the outcome of that case was that it was found that this man didn't actually have the mens rea to uh, commit the offence that he'd been held guilty for. False confession, I find this time and again. Suggestibility, may I put it to you, something that uh, sounds, oh yes, that sounds plausible. Belief in the truthfulness of others. Miss R has told the court there was no doubt that your actions amounted to rape. Undue compliance with authority, again wanting to escape, and total confusion under stress. An example of false confession, again from a police transcript. Detective Constable, did you ask Miss P if she wanted to have sex with you again that night? Suspect, uh -huh, yeah, I think so. What was her answer? Well, obviously it must have been no. I wouldn't be sitting here now in a police station. <laughs> Now, the outcome of that case, uh, after I had been called into it, was that this young man was found not even to have committed the actus reus, far less uh, the mens rea. Behaviour in the community, I get this all the time. Lack of insight, failure to understand normal social rules, pursuing strange and unusual interests in strange ways that make people think something suspicious is happening, impulsivity, all sorts of things. Here was the case that became quite a celebrated case in the work I was doing of Mr V and his offensive weapon. And this was from the notes of my psychological interview w with him. And this was a young man who spent most of his time because he didn't socialise with anyone. He was a complete loner and uh, had Asperger's syndrome. And he went around the bins. He had them all planned out. He had maps, he had routes. He went around the bins collecting uh, bottles. And um, that was his main interest. So he'd had a successful night. And it was late at night. I've had to change places and some other details, but because these cases can be very identifiable. So ask him, you were in the centre of Birmingham outside a busy nightclub late on a Saturday night when you found the knife in a bin. Did you have any concerns about that? Because the police had then found this man in this place with this huge dangerous knife in his inside uh, pocket. Did you have any concerns about that, about finding the knife? Mr V, yes, I did. I was very concerned. Why were you concerned? Because the knife had been put in a bin that was very clearly specified for glass only. <laughs> and this again was someone who was so far from having the mens rea to have been about to commit any crime. It was just ridiculous. Major gaps in autism and criminal justice. There's an urgent need for more research into these issues and much work needs to be done so that the criminal justice system can meet the needs of individuals on the autism spectrum. Let me conclude by asking, if you remember that the Autism Charter, the Charter of Rights for Persons with Autism, was um, come out from the European Parliament uh, 20 years ago in 1996. How well are we doing in the five areas that I've spoken about? Diagnosis, the right of people with autism to an accessible, unbiased and accurate clinical diagnosis and assessment, often not very well. And when you go beyond uh, Scotland, the UK, Europe, United States, uh, often just so far away from any reasonable provision. Mental health, 
the right of people with autism to appropriate counselling care for their physical, mental and spiritual health. How well are we doing? In many areas, not very well. Leisure, the right of people with autism to participate and benefit in and benefit from culture, entertainment, recreation and sport to have equal access to and use of all facilities, services and activities in the community. Not very well often. Transport. It mentions that specifically the right of people with autism to accessible transport and freedom of movement. And many of the people that come to see us at the National Diagnosis and Assessment Service, transport is a monumental difficulty and their life is completely constricted and they can't get anywhere because of uh, transport issues. And finally, criminal justice, the right of people with autism and their representatives to legal representation and assistance to the full protection of all legal rights and the right of people with autism to freedom from fear or threat of unwarranted incarceration. How far we still have to go 20 years after the charter was first published. In conclusion then, should we be gloomy about the gaps? Let me finish by saying this. My first clinical placement as an undergraduate working at uh, Psych uh, Glasgow University uh, in psychology was an autism placement, as it happened. And it was the only autism placement in the whole of the country at that time and it was a mental hospital. And most of the children and young people that I was working with on that placement, it was expected and it was fulfilled that at the age of 12, they would proceed on often into the locked uh, psychiatric wards where they would simply remain uh, forever. There wasn't a single specialist autism diagnostic service in the whole country and as far as treatment and intervention was concerned the main focus was on how to get better behavior controlling drugs and so the first research study that I participated in on that placement was a study looking to see whether the effects of haloperidol in controlling autistic behavior would be better than the effects of Largactyl. Should we be gloomy about the gaps, the only time you should ever look back is to see how far you've come. We have come very far, and I'll leave you with this. Is it much longer to go, he asked wearily. Yes, came the reply, but it's shorter longer than when we started. Thank you very much.